Hello everyone. So welcome to the Monday interactive session. So in today's session, so I'm going to uh, go through our homework four. Okay. So let's get started. So this is um, we're going through our homework four. Okay. So yeah, let's see our uh, homework. So. <clears throat> Uh, so in this homework, we basically focus on the system properties and the convolution. Okay, so let's see the first question. So the first question is that, so this is our system and uh, we're going to decide the properties of this system. Okay, so let's take a look to the first one. So that's our question number two. Okay, so so the question is that uh, y of n equals to n square multiply let's see multiply x of n okay so we write Let me open another version of the homework so I can see that in my in my another monitor. Okay, great. So the first question, uh, <clears throat> so this is our okay. So the first question number A is that so we're gonna decide whether our system is causal or not, right? So let's recall what is the definition of a causal system, right? Causal system. Uh, so let's see. We have our uh, so lecture slides here so you can find the information in both our lecture slides and uh, our lecture notes right so basically the meaning of a causal system um, is that so the output depends only on the current or the past input uh, and output right or output okay so so here we can see that so y n only depends on n squared multiply x of n right it's only a function of n which is a current time right so it means that yes that is causal okay so b is that we're going to uh, determine whether a system is memoryless or not right so Let's recall what is a memoryless system. So memoryless memoryless system it means that so the output depends on the current input, right? Which means that the output has to depend only on n, right? And uh, this is exactly this case, right? So output y of n depends only on the input at time n, right? Not n plus something or n minus something, just n, right? So it means that. It is a memoryless system. Okay, and C is that we're going to determine whether the system is is Bebo stable or not, right? Okay, so and we give something very similar in our uh, lecture, right? So normally, if we have something like this in front of uh, the input, so it is not a uh, Bebo stable system, right? To determine a system is not a people stable basically we just need to find a counter example right for example let's say how about we let x of n just uh, equals to a constant let's see one okay and then in this case y of n equals to n square right in this case when n goes to infinity and our y n will becomes infinity right this means that we have a bounded input but it is possible that we have an unbounded output right so it means that it's not people stable okay and uh, so d is to sketch the output when the input is xn equals to u n minus u n minus 2 
Okay, so so here um, we can see that so basically y n equals to what n square multiply x of n equals equals to n square multiply u u n minus u n minus two. Okay, and uh, so here we can what we can do is that we can sketch this one and use this to multiply that to get the output so that's probably easier right it says clear that so u n which is something like this one two three and so on and uh, u n minus two is we shift this function to the right by two units, right? So we start at two, three, four, and so on. And then we have zero at one, zero at zero, zero at negative one, and so on. Similarly here, right? So at negative one, we have zero, negative two, we have zero, and so on. Right, if we, we use this, subtract that, and then, right, we, have, we do a minus, then what we are going to get is that only the first two terms will be left, right? All other terms will be gone. So x of n is nothing but this, right? So this one. Okay, so now let's see if we, so this is our xn, so this is basically that, that guy, and then we use this, multiply n square, and see what we get right so now we can see that so if this guy multiply n square what is n square right n square is something like this so the function of n square so we just draw you know for n bigger than zero and if n is less than zero it doesn't matter so when n is zero it is zero when n is one it is one when n is two it is four and so on right so if we use this multiply that point wise of course then so if we use the multiplication here so what we're going to get here is nothing but so only we use this multiply that left right all other term will be gone okay so we can two three right so this will be nothing but one and this value is also one. Okay, and uh, that will be uh, the answer of this que this question, right? So we can write it down here. Since it just you know it just when n is one, it is one, and um, it's zero everywhere else, right? So this guy will be nothing but. So I can write this as delta n minus one. Right, because this basically means that when n is one, it is one. When n is not one, it's zero. Okay, so that uh, will be the the answer for question number two. Okay. Next, let's see our second question. Okay, our second question is is this one. So. Uh, again, it's very similar to the first one, but uh, the difference is that now the system is different, right? So what this system does is that so it's going to shift the input signal to the right by two unit, right? It's like delay by two unit, two time unit. Okay, so now let's see um, the solution for this uh, question. Q3. So now our output equals to x of n minus two, right? So number A, in this question, we're, we're gonna decide whether the system is called or not, right? We can see that, so the system depends on what, the past, right? So it's not the current, but depends on the past. Therefore, it is a causal system, right? It does not depend on the future, right? Okay, let's see the second one. The second one again is whether the system is memory or memoryless. So, it, so if the system is memory, so the output has to depend on the current input, 
right? But this output depends on the past input, right? Which is n minus two, right? So it means that this <coughs> system is not memoryless. So that is with memory. Okay. And number C is to say whether the system is Vivo stable or not. So clearly it should be uh, Vivo stable, right? Because if X, the input signal, Xn or X n minus two is less than infinity, then no. I say if the input Xn is less than infinity, then the output Y of n so that equals to x n minus two. That is less than infinity, right? Because, uh, okay. So let's write it more carefully, right? Because this holds for all n, right? For all n, therefore, so this holds also for all n. Okay. So let's see the uh, number d. So number d is to say that. If the input is delta n minus delta n minus one, then what is the output, right? So because that y n equals to x n minus two, therefore it should be equal to delta n minus two minus delta n minus three, and we're gonna sketch this signal. And uh, we can see that. So for this uh, this term, so it is basically equals to one when n is, or yeah, let, let's do this. So let's sketch both of them and then minus them together. Uh, okay, so delta n minus two is nothing but, let's say zero, one, two, at two we have a one, okay, three, or so on, negative one, negative two, and so on. And then let's draw delta n minus three. So it's very similar for this guy. It's equals to one when n is three and uh, zero everywhere else, right? Two, one, zero, negative one, negative two and so on, four, five, and so on, right? So if we use this guy minus this guy, and then we're gonna get the signal will be equals to one at two, and at three, it will be what? Negative one, right? This is negative one because this is the subtract four five one zero negative one negative two and so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So this is um, the result of the signal, and uh, we can write down the formula as well. So this equals to. So uh, basically equals to one when n is two equals to negative one when n is three and zero otherwise. Okay, very good. Next, let's see our problem number four. So this problem is very similar to the previous two problems. The only difference is that so now our in output is the integral of our input up to time t, right? Okay, so now let's see our question number four. So in this case, y of t equals two. So this time it is a continuous time signal instead of a, a discrete time signal, right? So y of t equals two, we'll do the integral from negative infinity to t, and uh, inside we have x tau d tau. Okay, again, number A is to determine whether the system is causal or not, right? And clearly, so the output would depend on all the x up to time t, 
right? It does not depend on any time instant of x uh, for the time bigger than t, right? Therefore, it is causal. It depends only on the current and the past, right? Second one is whether the system is memoryless or not. Right? Clearly, it is not memoryless, right? Because the output depends on the past, right? The past goes to negative infinity, right? It does not, it does, the output does not only depends on the time instant t, right? It depends on the past. So the system is a with memory system. Number C is to say whether a system, whether as this, whether a system is people stable or not. And again, so for this, uh, we can show that by counterexample, the system will not be people stable. So the example is that let x tau or x t equals to one, right? So it's a constant. Then in this case, y t will equal to d tau, right? That equal equals to uh, tau. We evaluate at t negative infinity. Right, so that equals to t plus infinity. Right, for any finite t, so this will not be, uh, will not be finite. Right, so that is infinity. Therefore, uh, the system is not people stable. Okay, so now let's see the last one, d. So in d. Uh, what we have is that let's say the input is x delta t minus delta t minus 1 and then we're gonna uh, compute and sketch the output right so now let's compute it so in this case the output y of t equals to the integral of x tau d tau that equals to delta t minus delta t minus 1 d tau so that equals to delta t so we can break this into two terms right d tau minus delta t minus 1 d tau and clearly so now we're doing oh no, okay here's tau sorry yeah so clearly the first term is that we're going to, we're doing an integral of delta tau from negative infinity to t and this is basically what u of t right so that's the definition one of the definitions for u of t and then in this case here's tau minus one so in this case let's see what we uh, what can we get okay so so in this case what we can do is that let's compute that separately so now it's delta t minus one, uh, delta, delta tau minus one, right? So we should write this as a function of an integral in terms of tau, right? To determine uh, what is the result. So now we do some uh, replacement of the substitution of uh, variable. So let, for example, tau prime equals two tau minus one right and see now what we have here is tau prime so d tau and d tau prime is the same right so before uh, tau uh, negative uh, tau is from negative negative infinity to t so so how about tau prime right so tau tau prime again is from negative infinity so when tau is t tau prime is basically what t minus one this equals to what u t minus one right okay by using this result what we get here is u minus u t minus one okay very good and now we can sketch it so i believe we have done that multiple times so u t minus u t minus one is nothing but so we have this is u t Right, u t minus one is this function shifted to the right by one unit, right? 
Therefore, if t is bigger than or equal to 1, it will become 0. So what you're going to get is something like this. right? It's a rectangle function. Okay. So when t is 0, we have 1. So when t bigger than or equal to 1, so we have all 0. It's all zero from here. It's all zero on the left hand side. Okay, very good. So this is our question number four. Next, uh, let's take a look at uh, question number five. So for this question, we're moving to see the property of linear and the time invariant. Okay, so we have the following six um, questions to solve. Okay, so let's solve it one by one. The first one is y is one. Okay, first question is y t equals to one. So this basically means that no matter what the input is, the, what the, the output is always one, right? So first, let's see the linearity. Right. The linearity defines as follows, right? So basically, from our lecture notes, we can see that if this is the out input, and then, so if the output can be written as the summation of this and that, then system is uh, linear, okay? So we can draw this uh, the, the system of this and that as follows. So it basically means that, so if we have two uh, signal as input, and then we first scale it and then do a summation of this two and then we pass this guy into the system and then we get the one output right and the other one is to we shift this output to this two locations right okay so then we get this system right so we shift the the, the system to these two locations and then we first let our input pass through the system and then we do the scaling and the, and the addition, and then we get another output, right? So if these two guys are equal, then we say the system is linear, okay? So basically, in order to determine whether a system is linear or not, we just need to verify whether this guy and this guy are equal or not, okay? So let's try to do that. So first, we need to see, so if the input is, let's say, if the input is ax1 of t, plus b, so this is the first computation, x2 of t, and then if we pass this guy through the system, right, which is h ax1 t plus b x2 t, and then this is 1, right, because no matter what the input is, the output will be 1. And uh, the second, um, the second thing we need to compute is the other equation, right? Which, which is the other formula, which is this guy, right? So let's compute that. So a h x one of t plus b h x two of t, and uh, we know that this guy equals to a multiplied one, right? And this guy equal to b multiply 1, right? Because no matter what the input is, the output of the system will be 1, and this equals to a plus b. Okay, clearly, so a plus b and 1, they're not equal in general. Okay, so this is, so this system is not linear. Okay, the next is the time invariant property. Okay, so time invariant property is defined by as follows. Right, it's defined here. So if y t minus tau equal to h x t minus tau, then we say the system is time invariant. So it basically means that, so if we pass the system through the, if we pass the input signal through the system, and then we shift on the output, so we get y t minus tau, 
right? So if we switch the order of these two guys, we shift the input signal first, and then we let the signal pass through the system, then we get another signal, right? If these two are identical, we say the system is time invariant. Okay, so now let's try to see whether the system is time invariant or not. So the first one is to verify this guy, right? That equals to one, right? Because so yt is always one. My second thing is to verify this. So we shift x by tau and then pass that through the system. Clearly, this is also one because no matter what the input is, the output is one, right? So therefore, it is time invariant. Okay, so this is the first question. So let's see the second question, which is y equal to x of 4t. Okay. B, y of t equals to x of 4t. So in this case, again, we're going to go through a step that we went before. So the first, we need to check whether the system is a linear or not. So two steps. The first step is to verify h a x t x1 of t plus b x2 of t so that let's see what that equals to right so we can see that here what the system does is that they do a scaling in front of the time in front of t right okay therefore this guy will equals to a x1 for t plus b x2 for t Right, because we need to just multiply 4 in front of t. Okay, and the second one is we need to verify this guy h x 2t, and that equals to <coughs> a multiply x1 4t. Right, because what the system does is that we multiply for 4 in front of t, right, plus b x2. 4t and now we can see that this guy and this guy they are equal right so the system is linear okay and the uh, time invariant property again the first step is to check y t minus tau see what does that equals to so this equals to x so this shift is over t, right? Therefore, this is what you get, right? So that equals to x for t minus four tau. Okay. Second one is that we need to check this guy, right? So remember, what the system does is that it multiply a four in front of t, right? So therefore, in this case. We need to multiply 4 in front of t, in front of t in the input signal. So we have x 4t minus tau. Okay, and clearly these two, they do not equal in general, right? So system is time invariant. It's not time invariant. Okay, so let's see the next one. The next one is c, right? c is y equals to, we do the derivative of x2t. Okay. okay. So now let's uh, check again the first, the linear arity. First step again, we need to double check this. a x1t plus b x 2t so that equals to d dt so what the system does is that they just do a derivative of the input and then we multiply 2 in front of t right so that is uh, that is a x 1 2 t plus b x 2 okay and uh, so we can write one more step here so this guy equals to what 
So we can take this, we can break this to by into two items and then take the constant out, right? A, B, D, T, X1, T, T, plus B, D, D, T, X2, T, T. Okay. And um, the second step we need to check is this guy, A, H of X1, T, plus B, H of X2, T, right? And this equals to A, D, D, T, X1, T, plus B, D, D, T, X2, T. Okay, clearly these two are equal, therefore it is linear. Okay, and then the time invariance property again we need to check two things the first one is y t minus tau so that will equals two so again we need to shift on t by tau and that is d dt x2 t minus tau equals to d dt x2 t minus Tell. Okay, and second step is to check this guy. H x t minus tau that equals to d dt. And uh, so here what we do is that we do a derivative of x to t. So now this is our x of t. Right? So we just need to multiply a 2t in front and then minus tau. Okay? So clearly these two are not equal, therefore it is not uh, time invariant. So it's time varying. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, C. So next, let's check D. D is this guy. And we do a summation of X of N from negative infinity till n, okay? For d, let's see. So y of n equals to t of n x of n. Okay, so again, we do two things. The first one is to check whether the system is linear or not. First step is to see this guy, H A X one N. Okay, so now we have a discrete time system. Right? And uh, so what the system does is that it takes the input from the negative infinity T O N and then we do the summation. Right? So this guy basically equals to this uh, a x1 n plus b x2 n so that equals to a oh sorry this is till n right not infinity okay x1 n plus b summation x2 yeah. Right? So the next step is to check the other formula. Plus B H X two N. Right? This guy equals to A plus B X two uh, sum. x2 and and clearly these two are equal so we have a linear system right linear and uh, next we check whether the system is time invariant or not two steps first one is to check whether so usually we use n minus n right for 
the time you for the discrete time system so this equals to um, so here we can you know for the dummy variable let's use n prime so x uh, m prime so here we have n minus m right so we just need to modify m to n minus m and this is what we got and second one is to check this guy x n minus m right so what the system does is that we just do a summation of the input signal from m the to inf a negative infinity of m right so let's try to do that so we have the dummy variable now we denote this as m prime to n and now what we have inside is x uh, m prime minus m okay okay so now let's do a, a, a substitution of the, the variable here how about we let this guy equals to m double prime okay so now m double prime again summation from negative infinity t also m prime is n right therefore <coughs> so when m prime is n the m double prime would be what n minus n right and uh, now we can write this okay so clearly these two guys are equal therefore it is prime invariant all right so this is for number d so next let's see number e right e is y n equals to e to the power of negative 2 and multiply x of n where x of n is the input right so let's write it down number e y n equals to e negative 2 n x n okay the first step is to check whether the system is linear okay first one let's check this okay so this guy equals to so c hmm? okay so what the system does is that we uh, take the input and then we multiply this by e to the power of 2n right so that equals to this guy basically a x1 of n plus b x2 of n right and that is so we can write one more step here uh, let's uh, write a here x1 n plus b e negative 2n x 2n okay and then we need to check this guy right and uh, so the, the output of the system is nothing but e to the power of 2n multiply the input x1n right and similarly we can write the second term okay and clearly this this guy and this guy they are identical so equal therefore it is a linear system okay next is the time invariant property so the first step is to check this guy right n minus n so that equals to e2 n minus m x n minus n right so that equals to e negative 2n minus uh, plus 2n x n minus m and second thing is to check this x n, n minus n so that equals to what so what the system does is that we just multiply a e to the power of 2n 
and the writing input. Okay, and clearly, so they are not equal. Therefore, the system is not time invariant. So this is time varying. Okay, good. And uh, let's see the last one, which is number f. So yn equals to this, this guy. Okay. So let's write it down. So f is y of n equals to half x n minus one minus two x n plus x n plus one. Okay. Now let's check. So again. We compute this guy. Okay, and what the system does is that we put a half in front and then take the input. And first is that we need to shift the signal by one. Okay, this is the first term, right? So this is the first term corresponding to the term here. And then minus 2xn, right? 2 multiply ax1 of n plus bx2 of n, right? And then add xn plus 1. So this is our x. So we need to add ax1 n plus 1 plus b x2 n plus 1 okay so this is basically our output right so the second item we need to verify is this guy x1 of n plus b h x2 of n okay let's see so the first guy is a multiply half x one n minus two x one x one n minus one sorry two x one n plus x one n plus one okay and plus b multiply half x two n minus one minus two x 2n plus x2 n plus 1 okay so if if you write uh, everything out here and do the same thing here you'll see that these two guys will be equal okay therefore the system is a linear system okay the next is time in yarn property Okay, the first step is to check this guy, right? Y n minus n. So that equals to half x n minus n minus 1 minus 2 x n minus n plus x n minus 1 n minus n plus 1. Okay, good. So the next step is to check this when the input is x and minus n okay and that equals to we take the half right and now what we do is that so for this term we just minus one of n so we have n minus one minus n second one is x n minus uh, n because we do not change our n here and the last one is x n plus 1 minus n. Okay, and clearly we can see that these two are equal, therefore the system is time invariant.
Okay, good. Next, let's take a look at uh, question number six. Okay, so, and this is our question number six. So basically, in this sex in this question, so we consider a LTI system, right? And input signal is ut minus ut minus one, and uh, the system transfer function or the unit impulse response of the system is ht equals to ut minus ut minus two. Right. So now let's solve for all of the questions here. First one is to draw ut and ht. So you can see that eventually we're going to compute the convolution of some input and the, the system, right? So no matter whether it is required or not, it is always good to draw, to sketch the input signal and uh, the system, right? So now here we ask you to sketch ht, ht and ut, and we better also sketch xt as well, okay? So now let's see this. Question number six. Okay, so we know that our x of t equals to ut minus ut minus one, and uh, our h of t equals to ut minus ut minus two, right? Okay. So let's see number a. It's ask you it asks you to sketch u of t basically something like that here's one here's zero right and um, h of t so h of t is the difference between this u of t and uh, the shifted version of u of t right so i have to we have been doing this for many times i'll just sketch it directly so it'll be something like this. Right here's zero, here's two, here's one, right? So we'll sketch it to be precise. So we know at two the function would be zero, right? Okay. But for convolution, it doesn't matter uh, what the value of the boundary point is, right? Okay, great. So now let's try to answer the second question. The second question is to ask you, is the LTI system defined by HT causal Y? So we know a system in class will have learned that if a system is causal, then we require that. Let's write it down. So if a system is causal, then we require HT uh, is zero for T less than zero. Right, you can see here the definition of this guy is identical as the causal signal, but the meaning is totally different. Right? In class, we explain why this should be true, but you know we need to be careful about the meaning of it. Right? Okay, so clearly, H of t satisfy uh, this condition. Right? Therefore, the system is a causal system. Right? System, yes, it is causal system. Now let's see number C. So in C, it asks whether the system is memoryless or not, right? So, so now we're considering a LTI system, right? If a system is memoryless, it requires that HT equals to some constant multiplier delta function, right? Otherwise, it will not be memoryless. So now ht is this rectangle function so clearly it is not memoryless right so it's not memoryless it's with memory and uh, for d it asks you to compute a sketch so this convolution x of t convolutes h of t okay so when we use a new page to do this okay so let's draw both signal D as you can com com compute x of t common loops h of t. Okay, so now 
So x of t in this case is, so remember that x t equals to u t minus u t minus 1, right? So if we draw x of t, it will be something like this. So this is x of t, right? And we know that h of t is this. So it's almost identical, but it's wider. Here's 2, right? So now let's do the convolution, right? Let's remember what are the steps of doing the convolution. So maybe we should write definition here. So definition is as follows. We do the integral from the negative infinity to infinity, and then we flip x, right, or flip x of tau, and then shift it by t, and then multiply h tau d tau. Okay, so the first step here is that we need to flip x, flip x tau. So now we need to write uh, the signal in terms of the dummy integral variable, right? So x negative tau is something like this. So now we ignore the boundary point, we just write you know, for simplicity in this way. Okay, great. So now we need to, uh, we need to shift the signal by amount of t, right? So this is ht. Okay, so Let's see, so first we need to shift, you know, consider the case where we shift this signal to the left, right, from the negative infinity t or something, right? Okay, so in this case. So by the way, if we consider this case, basically that is the case where t is zero, right? Okay, so let's draw something like that. So let's say here is the signal x, t minus tau, right? And the important thing here, we need to write down all the boundary points correctly, right? Let's see what are the boundary points here. So in this case, clearly, this guy would be t, and here is t minus one, okay? And uh, so now let's draw our h tau. So this is our h tau, okay, this is two. Okay, and in this case is basically the case that t is less than zero. Okay, and in, in this case, clearly our output equals to this guy. That will be zero because there's no overlap between this and that, right? You multiply this two function, it will give you zero. Okay, and then uh, the next one and next is that we, now we keep increasing our t so when t is zero x is it will become x negative tau so in this case so this guy and this guy will just touch right so we need to consider a little bit more so which is this case right so let's consider Maybe now I need to use another color to make it more clear. Okay, let's consider something like this. Okay, so this is our x t minus tau. And uh, the boundary point here again is t, here is t minus one. And, um, and this is again our h tau, okay? So in this case, let's do the integral. So y of t equals to x t minus tau h tau d tau. So the important thing here is the boundary integral boundary point here right now. So the overlap is like here. Therefore, the integral is from zero to t. And x of x t minus tau is one times h tau is also one and then d tau. Okay, clearly. Now, there's nothing but tau, we evaluate this function at t and zero, and then we get t. 
Okay. Very good. And uh, so now uh, for t, so this corresponds to the case where t is definitely bigger than or equal to zero. And then we need to figure out the, the boundary point of t here, right? So when this guy will be completely inside this, right? So that will be the boundary point, which means that so if this guy is inside this, t is nothing but less than or equal to one. So I'll just write less than one here. Okay, and um, so now let's consider next case. So we now we keep increasing t, so we make t bigger than or equal to one, right? So this is our h tau. So we know when t is one, so x of t will be something like this, right? So that is the case where t is one. And now we consider t if bigger than one, so x of t it will be x of tau, x of t minus tau will be something like this completely inside, right? So this is our x t minus tau. Okay, and uh, clearly, so we know that in this case, so in this case, so the boundary point is still t and t minus one, but so so if we keep increasing t, then when this guy, this point, arrive at this point, then that's basically the end of this case, right? So which means that beyond that, the integral limit will be changed, right? Clearly, if t arrive at this point, is a case where t is two, right? Less than two. Okay. So now we do the integral, y of t equals to, again, this guy. Equals to, so now the integral limit is from t minus one till t, and uh, one multiply one again, e tau, and uh, we get this, and that will equals to nothing but one, right? Okay, so the next case is that we keep increasing t when t is bigger than or equal to 2. So the relative location will be as follows. So it will be something like this. Right? This is x t minus tau and again so here's t here's t minus one right and in, in this case we can see that the integral limit would be from t minus one to two right so this point this part is important okay okay so now let's write y t equals to that equals to t minus 1 till 2 and then 1 times 1 d tau so then this is what we get equals to 3 minus d okay and clearly so we can see the boundary here is when t minus 1 equals to 2 then that should be the boundary right that means it's less than t equals to 3 Okay, after that, which is the last case, right, when t is bigger than or equal to 3, what we're going to get is something like this. And here t, here t minus 1, this is our x t minus tau. Okay, and in this case, clearly, this two function has no any overlap, and uh, our output will be basically zero. Okay, 
Okay, so now we can do a summarize of the final value, right? So it's a piecewise function. So it is as follows. So we can see that it is zero when t is less than zero. So when t is between zero and uh, one, what we have is t, right? And uh, when t is bigger than one and less than two, we have a one. When t is bigger than two and less than three, we have three minus t. And uh, lastly, we have zero when t is bigger than or equal to three. Okay, so if we want to sketch it, it will be something like this. Right. So there's zero, there's one, here is one, here is two, and here is three. Right, that's the output. So we can see that if we have two rectangle function and then we convolute uh, them together and they have a, if the, the width of them are different so we're gonna have a trapezoid right before if the width of this are, are the same so we have a, a triangle right which is showing class but if the widths are different then we're gonna have a trapezoid right okay very good so so we're not done with this yet and the next one is that we're gonna sketch a computer sketch the convolution of u t and h of t. Okay. E is to compute the convolution between u t and uh, h of t. Okay, so again, we're going to do the same thing. So now, so this we can write this as. u t minus tau h tau d tau okay we can basically flip u tau to get something like that this is u negative tau okay so now we're going to shift this from the left to the right and then compute the result right so the first case is that let's say here's our h 0 2 this is our h tau okay and uh, here is our u t minus tau okay and uh, again, the boundary point is always important, right? We need to write this boundary point in terms of t. Clearly, that is basically equals to t, and this corresponding to the case where t is less than zero. Okay, and uh, so in this case, clearly, the output is basically zero. Okay, so now let's see the next case. So now we keep increasing t until they do have some overlap, right? So the second case is that the second case is like this, right? This is our u t minus tau okay and here's t right clearly then in this case t should be bigger than zero and uh, yeah let me use blue color right the boundary point is again when t touch two right t has to be less than 2. So in this case, our output is right. So 
And so now the integral limit should be from 0 to t, right? From 0 to t, we have 1 multiplied by 1 dt, and that is equal to t, right? And uh, the next region is something like this. And now, so our ut minus tau will cover h of tau, right? This is our u t minus tau. And clearly, in this case, we have t is bigger than or equal to 2. OK? And uh, clearly, this would be the last regime, right? If we keep increasing t, Right, will not have any different, uh, you know, uh, relative relative position of the two signals. Therefore, in this case, our integral limit should be from zero to two. Right, so the integral limit should be just here, from zero to two, and we have one multiply one, and uh, what? detail right and then clearly that is two okay so so in summer in summary so y t equals to what zero when t is less than zero and when t is bigger than zero and less than two this is t and then when t is bigger than two bigger than equal to two it will be two right to sketch it y of t is something like this increase till 2 there is also 2 then it will keep 2 forever ok ok so now we finished uh, solving question number 6 next let's consider question number 7 so uh, question number 7 is pretty much uh, know the same as question six the difference is that so now we're considering a discrete time uh, signal system right okay so again the input is a rectangle function and the system function is also a rectangle function right so now let's uh, try to answer the following questions number seven Okay, so in this case, our x of n equals to u n minus u n minus three, and uh, h n equals to u n minus two minus u n minus four. Okay, so question A is to ask you to sketch u n and h of n get u n and h of n so let's try to do that so u of n it's like this right one two three and so on and um, four okay and uh, less than when n is less than zero is all zero and so on right okay good and the uh, hn so i have drawn the this kind of uh, rectangle signal many times so we need to be more careful that see how many items do we left here right so n minus two is to shift the signal to the right by two units and uh, n minus four is to shift uh, this signal to the right by four units, right? And uh, after this, we can see there are only how many two items left, right? When n is two, we're gonna have one here, and when n is three, we're gonna have one here and zero for all the other points.
Okay, so if you draw u n minus two and draw u n minus four, you'll see only two item will be that. Right. Okay, great. Now let's see b. So b is to determine whether h is causal or not. And clearly, in this case, the definition of the causal for the discrete time case is the same as the continuous time case, right? So we need to basically uh, double check that whether hn is zero when n is less than zero, which is true, right? So hn is zero when n is less than zero, therefore it is causal, yes, right? That is a causal system. And uh, for C, it's, uh, it's to ask whether the system is memoryless or not. So again, so in this case, <coughs> if the system is memoryless, so it has to be a form of a delta function, right? I mean, it should be a constant multiplied delta function. So in this case, clearly, it is not a constant multiplied one delta function, therefore, it is not, no, it's not memoryless. It is with memory. Okay. So for number D, it is to ask you to compute the convolution between X and H. Okay. To compute the convolution between X in and uh, H in. Remember this equals to what? Right. So we need to compute this summation, right? The procedure is identical as what we did uh, for the continuous time signal system, right? So we need to draw both x of n and, and h of n and see um, so see what can we do there so let's try to do that okay so so x of n here is let's try to remember it's u n minus u n minus 3 right clearly so x of n equal to photos Okay, so that will be our x of n, right? So we, so x of n will be one when n. Oh, sorry, when n is zero, one and two, right? Because that equals to u n minus u n minus three. Okay, and um, our h of n, we just draw that. Right, h of n equals to, let's see our last page. So h of n is n minus two minus n minus four, but only two item left here, right? So h of n, if this two, three, one, zero, and two, one, so on. be precise okay so now again in order to compute convolution we need to flip x and then shift from the negative infinity to plus infinity right for each point of m we need to do the convolution sum okay so let's see so what we do is that first step is again so we need to flip our x to get x negative m again so this is the case corresponding to n equal to zero right or x zero negative one negative two and it's all zero otherwise right and now we let's draw let's move x negative m from the left to the right, right? Okay. 
Okay, let's draw H first. Two, three. This is H. And this is H of M. Okay, at all other points, H of M is zero, right? And uh, our X is something like this. Okay, and uh, we can see, so if we do a shift to the left by M, so this basically means that here's M, here is N minus one, here is N minus two. Okay, and this, so this relative position corresponds to the case where N is less than zero. Okay, so when n is zero, is something like that. Okay, so now we're gonna increase n until this signal and this signal touch, right? So we can see that in this case. So let's write it uh, this way. We can see that in this is a case where. Uh, so it is n is less than zero, right? But we need to increase n until these two guys touch, right? So in that case, y of n output will be zero because there's no overlap, right? So we can see that if we increase n, when n arrive at this point, it will touch, right? This basically means that we need to make sure n is less than two or less than or equal to one basically right and the next case is that when this and that this guy touch right so something like you want to have two items for h so it's not mm, so this is our h m okay so we're, we can see that so one possible uh, location now for x is something like this, right? Okay. Yeah. It should be something like this. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. This is our x and um, minus m. And clearly, so this location corresponds to n, the value of n, right? And clearly, so in this case, so this is where n is 2. So in this case, there's only one point overlap, right? So yn equals 2. Okay, in this case, we only have one point overlap, so that's basically one times one, which is one. Okay, so next case is we keep increasing n, and until there are two points overlap, right? So h m, and uh, so we can draw. So we can overlap our x here. Okay, so this particular location is when, let's see here is x and minus m. So this particular location is the case where n is three, right? So, but if we shift n again, you know the summation limit will not be changed right because now if we do a summation so it will be from two to three right because those are the overlap point okay it turns out when n is three or n is four so we're gonna have the same uh, summation or you know same result so let's write it down x and minus m y m right so that equals two so now the summation here is from two to three and uh, we have only two items here right which is this guy and this guy 
is 1 times 1 plus another 1 times 1. In this case, we have basically 2. Okay? So the next relative position is that we keep increasing n. When n is 5, so we're going to get something like this. Okay, so this is the case where n is 5, clearly in this case, there is only one point overlap, right, so that will be 1, okay, and if we keep increasing a, if we keep increasing n, Okay, so it will be something like this. Right, so here's n, minus 1, minus 2. Right, so this is the case where n is bigger than 5. Okay, clearly in this case, because there's no overlap between this guy and this guy, so yn will basically be zero. Okay, so now we can write down our uh, results. So y of n will be zero when n is less or equal to one, and this one when n is two and it's 2 when n is 3 or 4 and it's 1 again when n is 5 and 0 again when n is bigger than 5 or bigger than 5 we can write it's bigger than larger than 6 okay and now we can sketch y n as follows so let's say at 2, it'll be 1, and at 3, 4, it'll be 2, and 5, it'll be 1 again, here's 1, here's 2, and at all other points, it'll be 0. And so on. Okay, so that is the the answer for for part D. Right. So now let's see part E. So in part E, we need to compute the convolution between U n and H of n. Okay. Okay. So this equals to. Very good. So now let's repeat uh, the step here. So basically, the first step is that so let's directly uh, flip u of m to get u negative m, which is something like this. So now, let's start our computation. So we're going to shift uh, u negative m to the left by amount of n, right? So let's draw our h here. 2, 3, this is our hm, right? And uh, in this case, so our u negative m 
So it looks like this. This is our unitium uh, unitium n minus n. Right, be careful here. So here the should be n because you know we shift to the left by n. And here should be n minus one, n minus two, and so on. So clearly in this case, uh, so the y of n should be zero because there's no any overlap, right? And um, so we need to figure out the range of n here, right? If n is less than zero, clearly it is case. If n is zero, there's still no overlap, right? So the range here should be if n is less than or equal to one, this two has no overlap, right? When n is two, so this guy and this guy will touch, right? Okay, so that is our next case, right? So when So when this guy will touch right, so that's the case where n is two, then our y n equal to this guy. We'll only have one term left, which is one times one, so that will be one. Okay. And the next case is where n is bigger than or equal to three, right? If we keep increasing it, we keep increasing n, and uh, we're gonna get something like this, right? So th again, this is our h of m, and now. So our u negative u n minus m will be something like this, and so on, right? Dot dot dot. Here's n. Here's n minus one, and so on, right? So this is our u n minus m. So in this case, now let's compute our summation. So y n again equals to this guy. Right. So now we can see in this case, in inside the summation there are only what two terms, which is n equal, which is two and three, right? M equals two and three. So basically, what we have is m from two to three, and u n minus m, h, m, right? Clearly, we have only what two item left. One times one plus one times one is two. And then that's it, right? If we keep increasing in, so it will be always like that, right? So now we're done. So we can write y of n is zero when n is less than or equal to one, one is one when n is two, and two when n is lar larger than or equal to three, okay? So if we want to sketch y of n, It will be as follows. Okay. So when n is one, it is one. When n is two, it is two. Oh, sorry. When n is um, should be careful here. So when n is two, it is one. When n is bigger than or equal to three. It will be two or five, six, and so on. One, zero, negative one, and so on. Right, and now we're done with our question number seven. Okay.
Next, let's take a look at uh, problem number eight, right? So in this problem, um, again, it's similar as the problem before. So now we have a system, so which is the voltage impulse response of the RC circuit. So that is given by this. So now we're going to solve the following questions, right? Which is very similar as the previous uh, questions, okay? So... Write it down problem number eight. So in this case, we have our unit impulse response of the system is e to the power of negative two t times u d. Okay, and um, so to better understand the system, we can simply sketch it. So in this class, so we it's always better to sketch everything, right? So it just looks like this, right? So e to the power of negative two t is, is something like that, right? So here's one, and then if t is less than zero, so it's all zero. Okay, good. So this is our h of t. So now let's see part a. So in part a. We need to see whether the system is called or not. Clearly, you know, from this picture and from the definition of a causal system, uh, we can see that, yes, it is causal because h of t is zero when t is less than zero, right? So let's see number b. So for part b, we're gonna decide whether the system is memoryless or not, and clearly, we can see that h of t is not a constant multiplied delta function, therefore, so it is now it's not memory, so that is actually it's not memoryless, right? Let's see number c. Number c is to determine whether a system is people stable or not. Okay, so so let's see. So in this case, so what we need to uh, decide is this. We need to compute whether h of t is absolutely uh, integrable, right? So now let's compute that. So this is given by this. Right? That is from 0 to infinity, right? Because when t is less than 0, it's it's a signal, I mean, h of t is zero, and uh, right, and this is negative half e t, okay, and then clearly, see this is zero minus negative half equals to half, that is less than infinity, right, therefore, the system is be, yes, it is be, be both stable, okay, so, or part D is to compute the convolution, right? Where we have the input signal as u of t, and uh, now let's compute this guy. Okay. Or part D, we want to compute y of t equals to u t convolutes h t. Right? Again, it doesn't matter which one to flip, so we can just do this u t minus tau h tau d tau we can we can just flip u of t u of tau here right so let's do that okay we directly consider step two right after flipping uh u of tau so what to and the shift is by t so we can have something like this right of Right, so here's t, so uh, maybe I'll use the, yeah, let's, let, let's first sketch h of tau first, right, so this is our, this is our h of tau, and uh, as usual, let's use the red color to sketch u t minus tau. So 
again the boundary point here for this point is t basically right if t is zero so this is just u like to tell okay and then we can see that so these two guys will touch each other when t is zero right therefore so this corresponds to the case where t is less than zero and in this case yt equal to zero right and if we're increasing t and uh, we're gonna get something like this right again here's t so this is u t minus tau right and uh, this is r h tau okay so in this case let's compute y t equals to u t minus tau h tau d tau okay clearly now the integral limit should be from 0 to t right so that is from 0 to t so in this region u t minus tau is 1 and h tau is so let's see it's given by this right so it's e to tau so we do not need to write down the u tau here right because that will help us to determine the integral limit right d tau and uh, here we're gonna get this equals to negative half e to tau we evaluate this guy at t of zero and then so that equals to uh, half e negative 2t 2t and then minus negative half right that equals to half uh, let's say let's write things together 1 minus e negative 2t okay and clearly this is the case where t is bigger than or equal to 0 okay and then we're done we only have these two special cases okay and um, and uh, we can write down y of t equals to 0 when t is less than 0 and when t is bigger than or equal to 0 we have half 1 minus e to t okay and uh, we can write this in a simple form by using u of t so that equal equal to times u of t okay very good so now let's try to sketch it okay so here is basically we have uh, e to the power of negative 2t like that so we need to flip it according to the uh, horizontal axis and then shift it above by half right so it will be something like this here should be negative half and uh, right something like that so when t goes to infinity it will approach this line which is half right okay good and uh, the last question here is that we need to compute a sketch this convolution when the input signal x of t is given by uh, this guy e to the power of negative t multiply u of t plus 1 right so for e so in this case we need to compute a sketch y t equals to x of t convolutes h of t where x of t equals to e negative t u t plus 1 okay so yeah maybe in this case let's first sketch what x t is right let's see so x t is um, e to the power of negative t but multiply u t plus one so that is we can so so u t plus one is u t shift to the left by negative one therefore so this is what we have for 
x of t. Okay. Make it one, zero. Okay, and here is. Okay, so this is the x of t. So again, now let's see how can we uh, compute the convolution. So yeah, let's write it. So here we may, you know, let's draw step one. So which is draw x negative tau, right? So this should look like this. Okay, negative one, zero. Okay, here's one. This is our x negative tau. Again, this corresponds to the case where t is zero. Okay, so now let's start doing the convolution. So basically, as you rule, we draw our h like that. Okay, and now let's draw our x, right? So if we shift this to the left, so we're gonna have something like that. Okay, okay, let's draw this so in this way. This is our h tau, and we're gonna draw the x in red like this. Right. Okay, so now it's important to again see the boundary point here. Let's see what is the boundary point, right? So, so here, so we can see, so this corresponding to the case where t is zero, right? So if we shift this to the left, right? And then what should be the point here? Okay, how to represent this point? in terms of t right so so we can see that when t is zero so this point is okay here we make a mistake so this point should be one right not negative one right so when t is zero this point is one so you can guess that so you know if we want to represent this point in terms of t it should be more or less like t plus one right you can double check it's always the case right Therefore, in this case, we can write, yeah, we can, we can represent this point by t plus one, and this is our x t minus tau, and um, so here's t, and in this case, we can see that this corresponding to the case where t plus one should be less than uh, zero, right? So that means t is less than negative one. So in this case, we have y of t is basically zero, right? Because so this guy and this guy, they do not overlap. So the next case is the case that, So this two guy, this two guy may overlap, right? So again, this is our x t minus tau, and here is t plus one, right? So in this case, so this basically corresponding to the case where t is bigger than or equal to negative one, okay? So in this case, uh, we could compute the the convolution so that equals to this okay so that equals to uh, so we can see that integral here is nothing but from 0 to t plus 1 right okay and now let's see in this case our xt equals to this guy right so it's e to the power of negative t minus tau basically but we don't need to care about the u right because that will just define the integral limit and the way we know that already is from 0 to t plus 1 and h of t h of tau will equals to 
Mm. As we we'll call it of L. Uh, equals to, yeah, maybe let's just see here. Equal to this guy, right? E to the power of negative 2t. E to the power of negative 2 tau e tau. Okay, so now let's compute it. So this equals to, so here we have e to the power of negative t. So that part can, we can take that out, e negative t. And inside is e tau times e to the power of negative 2 tau, which is the e to the power of negative tau in the end, e tau. So this equal to negative 1 e negative tau t plus 1 and 0 right that equals to e negative tau and the inside we have 1 minus e negative t plus 1 okay and uh, then this equals to e negative t minus So now we could combine this and that. So we have e negative 2t plus 1, uh, 2t minus 1. Therefore, uh, the result is so y of t will equal to e to the power of negative t minus e to the power of negative 2t minus 1 when t is bigger than or equal to negative 1 and then when t is less than negative 1 it will be 0 let's see right okay great okay again so we can represent this by using uh, u of t so that equals to e negative uh, to the power of negative t minus e power of negative 2t minus 1 together multiply u t plus 1 okay so that will be our result and uh, now you can try to uh, sketch it okay and uh, what we do now over here for this guy is that so at uh, t equals to negative 1, when t is less than negative 1, so we're going to have all 0, right? And we just need to see a little bit more careful about special point. For example, when t is 1, then this guy will be equals to 0, right? You can double check. And, uh, and then from this equation, maybe it's uh, more clear. Right, we can see that when t goes to infinity, so this guy will always will also be zero, right? Therefore, this function should be more or less, you know. And we know this guy is always positive, so we can see this function is more or less like we increase first and then decrease till zero. It is more or less maybe, you know, we don't need to be very precise, maybe something like that, right? And um, so this is a little bit more complicated, uh, very com a little bit complicated. And, um, you know, if we sketch like that, it will be okay, right? If you're interested, you can plot this in MATLAB and see where is the maximum point. Or you can simply do the derivative of this and make it equal to zero and see when, you know, the highest point that will be, right? It should be slightly less than zero. Okay, very good. So this is our question number eight. Okay. Next, let's see our last question. So uh, last question is question number nine. So basically we consider three discrete time systems known as systems one, two, and three. So with the input signals x1, x2, and x3, and output signals as y1, y2, and y3. So those are the three systems. So in this question, so what we're going to do is that Suppose the three systems are connected in series like this, right? And then, uh, so it asks us to find the impulse response of each of overall system, right? 
So let's see how to solve it. Question number nine. Okay, so basically in this case, so what we do know is that, so let's see the problem again. So y of n will be basically equals to what? Well, basically equals to y2 of n comma roots h3, right? So y of n will equals to uh, y3 of n comma roots with h3 of n, right? And here, y uh, y2 sorry so it should be y2 and uh, so y2 is y1 convolutes with h2 right so that equals to y1 convolutes with h2n together right and let's see y1 is nothing but x1 convolutes h1 Right, this equals to uh, xn comma roots h1 right that's y1 and then together comma roots h2 and uh, together comma roots h3 yeah. right so now because of the property of convolution right so uh, yeah we don't need this because of the property of the convolution, so what we can do is that we can get rid of this parenthesis, right? Xn convolutes Hn convolutes H2n, right? So, and that we can also get rid of this parenthesis and uh, get Xn convolute H1 convolutes h2 convolutes h3 right and here so because of the the property of the convolution so we can be basically combine the last three terms Right, and then this is basically our system h of n. Okay, so now we have y n equals to x of n convolutes this. Right, this is nothing but the convolution of h one, h two, and h three. Okay, so we can see. So basically, if we uh, write uh, the system in series, so basically the overall system is h one convolutes h two convolutes h3 right and we know all of them here so now let's see what is the result of h of n okay so let's write down okay in this case so by the way the property we were using here so why these guys are equal is the associative property of the convolution right Okay, so let's see, h1 in this case is 6 delta n, h2 is delta n minus 1, and uh, h3 is negative delta n minus 1 plus delta n plus 1. Okay, so here, so h of n equals to this comma roots h2 comma roots h3 right that is 6 uh, delta n comma roots delta n minus 1 comma roots this right okay very good so now, so, so in this convolution straightforward, right? So now we're going to use another property of the convolution to compute this guy, right? Let's recall that. So what we do know is that if we do use uh, delta convolutes delta n, so that is 
equals to dot n right because because of the identity property of the delta function for convolution right so now we're going to use the shifting property of the convolution right so shifting property basically uh, means that the shifting property or delay property and let me check whether we call this shifting property or not you call this time shifting property okay so let's be more precise right the time shifting property tells us that so if let's say if we use hn convolutes xn so let's say this is yn and then if we shift this by m1 and if we shift this by m2 and then in the end it will be shift m1 and m2 right and here so we can basically you know see if this is delta function so if we shift the first one by m1 right if and we shift second one by m2 in the end it will be shift delta shift by m1 plus m2 right and by using this property, we can basically compute this guy, right? Okay, so now let's see h of n equals to, let's copy that, 6 delta n convolutes delta n minus 1 convolutes negative delta n minus 1 plus delta n plus 1 okay this will be right so 6 we can take that out and the delta convolutes delta n minus 1 you know here it corresponding to the case where m1 is 0 and m2 is 1 right that will be delta n minus 1 and then we can multiply uh, sorry we can copy this down right so so now we can use the distributivity property of convolution and uh, use this convolute that plus this convolute that right the first one is x n minus 1 and the minus 1 again I will have a negative sign in front and second one is 6 delta n minus 1 and plus 1 Right, so then we get 6 delta and minus 1 minus 2 and 6 delta n. Okay, so this is basically uh, our result for h of n. Okay, so now let's see our part b. So in part B, suppose the order of the three system is reversed, right? Which means that we have H3 first and then H2 and then H1 and then find the impulse response of H, right? We know uh, we have the commutative property of convolution, right? So which means that, uh, let's say, H1n convolutes H2n, so that will equal to H2n convolutes H1n, right? So it means that when we do the convolution, the order doesn't matter, right? Therefore, in this case, the, the, the new impulse response of the system would be the same as before, right? In this case, so HN would be the same as this one, okay? So it will not be changed, right? So now, so we, did, we went through all the homework problems, right? So please, you know, when you have questions, please take a look at this video, but try your best to do everything on your own and try to understand everything. Okay, so great. So, okay, that's all for today. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye.